make no mistake, now is the time to modernize North Carolina's revenue system. Um, as most of you are aware, it is a system that is obsolete, badly out of date. Um, its purpose, of course, is to fund investments in the public structure, the schools, the courts, the hospitals, colleges, and universities that are critical uh, to building and preserving a strong middle class in a 21st century economy. But right now, North Carolina's outdated system is really failing the people of North Carolina. While the Great Recession directly caused the collapse in state tax revenue, it is not, it is not the reason why now, with the state's economy slowly start, starting to turn around, that state revenues remain below pre-recession levels. That fact is directly attributable to the obsolescence of our system. Unless we take actions to modernize the way we collect tax revenues, North Carolina is setting itself up for a perpetual budget crisis, even when the, fi the economy finally does fully recover. Only by responding to the current fiscal crisis through a balanced approach that addresses the fundamental problems with the state's revenue system will state policymakers secure the long-term fiscal foundation of the state's public structures. So, how do we pull this off? What do we do to get ourselves out of the fix that we're in? Uh, the way we deal with these issues on a daily basis in North Carolina is to listen to the wise counsel to get folks at the North Carolina Budget and Tax Center. They're co-sponsoring the event with us today. And they're scattered throughout. We'll hear from Alexander, Alexander Sirota, who's the director of the Budget and Tax Center, after our main uh, speaker. Please subscribe to their stuff, grab their materials that are there on the table. They are, there's no other one, there's no other group like them in North Carolina, and they're the best of what they do in the country, so we're proud of them. But for today, our main man uh, that we did designated to point the way is Matthew Gardner. Uh, Matthew Matt is the executive director of, of ITEP, uh, Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. His work focuses on state and local tax systems and their effect on low and middle income taxpayers. He is the author of Who Pays? This is a, a document we've used uh, for years in the Justice Center and Policy Watch. A distributional analysis of state and local tax systems in all 50 states. It shows really that the way that the tax responsibility is spread across the income groups in our state and other states. He's authored a number of comprehensive studies on specific state's tax systems, including achieving adequacy tax options for New York in the wake of the CFE case, 2005, tax options for Arkansas, funding education after the Lakeview case, 2003, balancing act, tax reform options for Illinois, 2002, and choices for Iowa, building a better tax system, 1998. He's also the primary author of the ITEP Guide to Fair State and Local Taxation, a primer designed to teach lawmakers and advocates the fundamentals of state and local tax policy. Other studies by Mr. Gardner include tax simplification options for Iowa, a plan for progressive tax reform in Alabama, uh, revenue raising options for Louisiana. You get the idea. He's conducted tax analysis uh, for state and policy, uh, state and local policymaker advocates in 45 different states. <coughs> Mr. Gardner, uh, the best thing about him, uh, he, he is actually originally from Raleigh, North Carolina, born here, probably one of a small number of people in this room. Uh, he resides in Washington. He has degrees from the University of Maryland and the University of Rochester. And so we're delighted to welcome him to the podium. And please help me uh, welcome him. Matt Gardner. I, uh, I get an awful lot of mileage out of uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, because no one ever wants to hear from them from Washington, D.C. Uh, I, I was born here. Uh, my dad's first faculty job uh, was in the Agricultural Economics Department, thank you, at NC State. And uh, if, you, if you know a lot of economists, you know that economists like to tell jokes and that they have a tendency to tell really very bad ones. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to subject you to one of his favorites, probably the first joke I remember him telling as a kid. That seems kind of apropos. Uh, Sunday morning, the uh, preacher is talking to his, uh, preaching to his uh, congregation. Fire and brimstone, real serious service, rapt attention in the room. The preacher says, in a hundred years, everyone in this congregation will be dead. Dead silence in the room. All in their feet. Uh, but there's a little voice in the back going, the preacher can't believe he leaves. He looks back and says, don't you understand? In a hundred years, everyone in this congregation will be dust. Again, he sees this guy in the back row slapping his knee. The preacher says, look, what's your, what's your problem? Don't, don't you understand the, the permanence of your, your faith here? And 
the guy says, well, you know, I'm not a member of this congregation. <laughs> Dad, Dad told this joke not to uh, get a laugh, and he generally doesn't, uh, but because it illustrated uh, what he viewed as a pretty fundamental part of the way we as human beings think about the long term. You know, we focus on the here and now, we focus on getting through the day, the week, the year, and that's as true of the rest of us as it is of lawmakers. Uh, you know, that's a pretty negative view of, of human nature, but uh, it's a real privilege to be here uh, today because, uh, you know, right now, state policymakers on both sides of the aisle are paying at least lip service here in North Carolina to some real long-term tax reform issues. And uh, so it's it's great to be invited to be part of that conversation. I want to thank Rob and folks at Policy Watch for having me here to talk about it. It's a real privilege. Um, by the way, uh, speaking of uh, church, uh, as you know, the rapture began on Saturday afternoon. And if there are any lingering doubts in your minds about whether you've been selected, I think the next half hour will clear that up in the negative. <laughs> so, uh, as I said, I think uh, it's, it's great to be here because North Carolina is a state that, unlike many, is thinking seriously about forward-thinking uh, tax reform issues. And so it's a good chance to separate the wheat from the chaff and talk a little bit about what's good that's being discussed and maybe what isn't on the agenda yet that, that ought to be. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is uh, working for you. Uh, oh, let me see. It's, oh, there we go. Got it. Uh, maybe it's a little higher. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, first and foremost, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, obviously, I want to talk about some of the, uh, the structural constraints that state tax systems in North Carolina in particular face that uh, should make you quake in your boots about the long-term uh, security of the state. Uh, second, to talk about what other states have done in recent years that really ought to give you hope that similar reforms can be enacted in North Carolina. Third, what North Carolina policymakers are discussing right now, the good and the bad, how to think about that. And I want to place this as we go along in the context of what we think a good tax system ought to look like. What are the basic principles on which most people can agree? And more importantly, what do those principles mean? Uh, we all would agree that fairness is a good thing. The problem is half of us think one, one thing and half of us think it's something else. Uh, so first, a quick word about, uh, I already told you more than you, than you need to know about me personally. Uh, ITEP as an organization has been around since 1980. Uh, we were founded in the wake of what is generally viewed as the biggest failure of state legislative policy, uh, or state legislative inaction, I should say, in the last quarter century, which is California's Proposition 13, which, as you probably know, put a strict cap on property tax laws, eviscerated schools, and ended up really deforming the state's uh, tax system for decades to come. Uh, the thing that makes us, uh, in theory, worth listening to in state houses and in Washington, D.C. at the federal level is that we've got a computer model that lets us figure out, for pretty much anything you want to do to your tax system, how it's going to affect people at different income levels, and importantly, what the revenue yield of these tax changes are. Uh, and we also, uh, for folks who would rather see things other than numbers all day, we also put out a weekly report in conjunction with Citizens for Tax Justice that we call the Tax Justice Digest, which you can get an email subscription to, uh, which basically highlights the five or six most interesting things going on in the tax policy world in a given week. And yes, there are five or six interesting things going on in the tax policy. Uh, so I urge you to sign up for that, and there will be instructions at the end on how to do it. So this is a starting point, uh, because I'm going to be slinging around uh, Terminology. I wanted to talk a little bit about what, in our view, constitutes a, a successful uh, tax system, and then we can move to how the state falls short on these principles. Uh, first and foremost is fairness. As I alluded to a minute ago, fairness means a lot of things to a lot of people. But what I want to start out by pointing out is that fairness has three very distinct dimensions, each of which is something you all ought to be thinking about as you consider tax reform going forward. One element is what economists call vertical equity, how a tax system affects people at different income levels. 
uh, low-income folks versus the very best off. A uh, second element is horizontal equity. And the idea here is that if you've got two people with the same income, same house, same spending patterns, identical people, the tax system ought to treat them basically the same. And all too often that's not the case, either because of a special tax break for this or that, or uh, 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 a third element is generational equity. Uh, we forget too easily about this, and it's more of a problem at the federal level but also a concern at the state level. Uh, we want to make sure that whatever uh, solution we come up with for balancing the budget in the short term, it's fair in the long term, that we're not uh, unfairly loading up our kids and our grandkids with the cost of funding public investment. A second uh, principle that I think I'm gonna come back to again and again is uh, base broadening. The idea here is that a tax has a sufficiently broad base if whatever it's supposed to apply to, uh, retail purchases in the case of the sales taxes, uh, the income you earn every day in the case of the income tax, it ought to apply to all of it, unless there's a really good reason to exempt it. Uh, whether it's salaries and wages and capital gains and dividends and pension benefits on the income tax side, or everything from groceries to haircuts to car repairs on the sales tax side, the starting point ought to be that you tax all of these things with as broad a base and as low a tax rate as you can and still fund public investments. Uh, that's not to say that the <coughs> exemptions didn't exist. It is to say that we need to have a darn good reason for them. A uh, third element, and this is obviously, uh, I, I think, the bread and butter for state lawmakers, it's what they get elected to do right, is adequacy. Uh, keeping the trains running, uh, you know, getting the bills paid this week this fiscal year is absolutely uh, the first thing that policymakers need to be concerned about. Uh, I'm gonna argue, until uh, I'm blue in the face, that adequacy also has a long-term component that is every bit as vital. And while it's not, you know, it, it's a bonus when lawmakers think about it as they are in North Carolina right now, um, but it's never enough to say that you're balancing the budget this year, you have to think about next year. Uh, you know, this, in a way, this is a no-brainer, but if you look around at what other states are doing right now, you see Illinois fixing their budget uh, situation by actually accelerating uh, sales tax payments from fiscal 12 into fiscal 11, basically changing 2011 into a 13-month year. I mean, that, that's the, uh, it works. It solves your problem in fiscal 11, but it obviously takes a month away from fiscal 12, uh, which I think they're now beginning to notice. Uh, simplicity. I think this is a uh, pretty vital one for a couple of reasons. One is that you know simplicity is unambiguously a good thing in a tax system. People should be able to understand how a tax system works, who is affected by it, why every element of it exists insofar as these things can be understood. It shouldn't be operated under a cloud, it shouldn't be confusing, and it shouldn't be a 40-page tax form that you have to file out every year. The second reason why it's an important thing to talk about is that simplicity is also a contested notion in the sense that some of the people who talk about simplicity are proposing remedies for a complexity, tax complexity, that really don't make things a lot simpler. And you know, as an example, uh, you know, if you look at the North Carolina tax forms, uh, you know, you've got an awful lot of lines for specific tax breaks for this and that and the other thing, exemptions, deductions, credits. The uh, the rate structure, by contrast, the graduated rate structure is basically one line. And calculating a graduated rate tax is not inherently more complex than calculating a flat tax rate. I think that's an important thing to recognize about simplicity and, and what it is and what it isn't. Um, equally important, economic development consequences. Whatever you do to your tax system, it shouldn't be putting your state's economy at a disadvantage. Uh, I bring this up here primarily to point out that there are two sides to the economic development coin. Um, all too often, uh, people are, think of taxes as simply a negative. They take things away from, take things away from private citizens, and that's just a, a drain on the economy. Well, that's only true if you're taking tax revenue and flushing it down the toilet or keeping it under the bed. And of course, we're not doing that. The economic development impact of a tax cut that eviscerates education or transportation. Can be, is as likely to be negative as it is to be positive, and it's important to recognize uh, both sides of that equation. 
Uh, neutrality just means that your tax system shouldn't be the reason individuals or businesses do things. Uh, businesses should engage in investment. People should engage in their everyday economic decisions based on what makes economic sense in the market, not based on what the tax system is encouraging them to do. And lastly, exportability. You, you, your tax system should be uh, able to take advantage of folks like me who are visiting for the day. Uh, Non-residents and businesses, multi-state businesses, impose costs on your infrastructure, and it's important to share that across the, across states. So, um, those are the terms I'll be throwing around. What are the systemic challenges that North Carolina and other states face right now? Uh, first and foremost, <coughs> as I mentioned, exemptions, uh, loopholes. The sales tax is probably the most obvious example of this, and I'll get into a little more detail on this in a minute, but. There is a hodgepodge of exemptions in the sales tax, both for the everyday physical things we buy every day, like groceries, and for the things that didn't exist when the sales tax got enacted, uh, services, uh, car repair, haircuts. Uh, you know, these are things that the original drafters of the sales tax laws didn't envision being a big part of the economy. Well, they're big and they're growing. Uh, a second element of sales tax uh, uh, systemic challenges has to do with economics. Even things that are supposed to be taxed all too often are not taxed because they're bought on the internet. Uh, North Carolina has taken some uh, good preliminary steps towards fixing that, but it's far from, uh, far from complete. Um, on the corporate tax, this is another area where uh, reform is definitely necessary. Um, I'll show you some stats later on that uh, will make your hair stand, stand on end if you're you're all still awake. The uh, the the, uh, the corporate tax base, especially at the state level, is leaking uh, from multiple sources. Um, this is because both of the capacity of multi-state companies to arbitrarily shift their profits on paper from one state to another uh, add to that the impact of tax breaks that lawmakers here in North Carolina have granted to specific corporations often without sufficient oversight. Add to that the impact of federal tax breaks that are being expanded even as we speak in Washington, D.C. that pass through directly to reduce the North Carolina corporate tax base. All three of these are issues that threaten the uh, North Carolina corporate tax. On the personal income tax, this is probably the most important area and certainly is the building block around which uh, sustainable reform needs to be made. Uh, North Carolina, like virtually, uh, well, like 75% of the states with income taxes, allows tax breaks, uh, itemized deductions borrowed from the federal government, um, a host of other tax breaks, exemptions, deductions, and credits, each of which is well-intentioned, each of which has its defenders, and each of which uh, leads to the death by a thousand cuts uh, that the income tax is now subject to. Uh, there's this direct tension with the income tax, with the corporate tax, with the sales tax, between providing each of these tax breaks, again, each of which people like, and what the overall rate has to be. The broader the base, the, broader the, base, the lower the rate can be. The more exemptions you enact, the higher the rate has to be to raise money. Uh, I'll pass over property taxes. Uh, on, on sin taxes, the structure of the systemic challenges that people keep relying on. This is less of an issue in North Carolina than it is in many states. It's only really with the, uh, the gas tax, I guess, where you see that this tax just isn't really especially able to keep up with the cost of funding uh, transportation. But the thing to know about sin taxes as a way of uh, paying for things is that in general, they're based on how many units get consumed. If you're gonna tax cigarettes, unless uh, there's gonna be a, a growth in the number of smokers or the growth in the number of uh, packs people buy, these revenues aren't going up. It could be a short-term solution, but it is emphatically not a long-term solution to whatever fiscal woes you face. Uh, so why is it that uh, policymakers in North Carolina and elsewhere are not thinking like this guy in the back pew? Why are they thinking about 75 years from now, these challenges that, uh, that they don't have to address right now? The short answer is that based on the recent recession, they kind of do have to think about it. You can make a strong case that the reason taxes are just going in the tank at the state level in North Carolina and elsewhere the last couple of years, in a way they haven't, 
at any time in the last 40 years is because these gradually accruing uh, holes in state tax bases really are starting to take their toll. The uh, uh, retail sales are shifting dramatically towards services. Uh, that has an impact also on the corporate tax. Uh, the aging population is absolutely diminishing the income tax. And that is <coughs> accelerating the decline that you see in uh, state tax revenues during a downturn. There are ups and downs every, every five, 10 years. We've had three recessions in the last 20 years, each of which has really knocked inflation adjusted tax revenues down. But nobody has seen anything like, like what's happened in the last three years. And I think people are starting to realize that the structural problems we all face are a big part of that. The second element of the, uh, the ongoing interest in long-term tax reform is that we're not facing a recession that is not only deep, it's really quite long. At this point, uh, at, at three years in, we're, we're facing a bigger decline in state tax revenues uh, right now, after three years, than we have been at any point during the last three recessions. Lastly, this decline in state tax revenues is not confined to any particular tax. Everything is performing badly. You can't pin it on the income tax. You can't pin it on the corporate tax. Nationwide, all the major taxes states rely on are going downhill fast. So it's a big, comprehensive problem. <laughs> it's increasingly an issue right now because the way states have managed to hobble through without imposing really damaging cuts on the spending side the last couple of years has been with aid from the federal government. That aid is drying up right now. Uh, going forward, states are going to be pretty much on their own in dealing with the, uh, what's left of the fiscal shortfall. So uh, that's the, uh, the happy part of what I'm going to say. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the additional constraint facing North Carolina right now, and it's a constraint that you share with virtually every other state, is that as you think about revenue raising uh, in any form as part of tax reform, uh, there's, it's, it's pretty hard to make a case for increasing taxes on lower, lower income families. And this chart shows why. This is uh, sort of our flagship product, the thing we do every few years. It's called Who Pays, is the name of the report. It compares tax incidents, the effective tax rates on people with different income levels in every state. And the headline in North Carolina, again, as it is in most other states, is that no one pays more of their income in state and local taxes right now. When you add up the income, sales, property taxes, pass through of corporate taxes, no one pays more of their income in taxes in North Carolina than does the very poorest uh, income group. Uh, Middle-income families pay a lot more as well. In fact, the single group that pays the least of its income in state and local taxes, substantially less than anyone else, is the very top 1% of the income distribution and the top 20% generally. Now, we separate out in this chart the poorest 20% of the population at the left from the very top 1% of the population at the right uh, for a very simple reason. The top 1% is so dramatically different from everyone else in the top quintile. Uh, this is a group that has more than 15% of the income uh, in the state. Uh, there's a very high concentration of capital gains in this income. Uh, it's just, it's a different group from even this next 15%, this next 4%, the rest of the top group. There's moderately well off and there's really well off. And the North Carolina tax system is essentially given a free pass to the really well off compared to everyone else. Um, why is this? Uh, the main reason in North Carolina, as elsewhere, is that there are three taxes states generally rely on that have a real in-state impact. The income tax, the sales tax, and the property tax. Two of these taxes, the sales tax and to a lesser degree the property tax, fall inexorably, most heavily, on low and middle income families. The only option states really have for having a suitably progressive tax, that is one that hits low and high income families at least as heavily as low income families, is the personal income tax. And in North Carolina, as in most states, <coughs> these two regressive taxes falling most heavily on low income families outweigh the one progressive tax. Now before I uh, uh, talk a little bit more about solutions to the structural problems that is outlined, I think it's important to think not just about the policies you want to see, but about the institutions that can get you there. Procedurally, a lot of states make it very hard for lawmakers to do the right thing, to think about long-term issues, to eliminate exemptions, the budget for the long term. So I want to spend two minutes just talking about procedurally what you can do to make sure these outcomes are likely to happen. 
Uh, the good news is that probably the most important step any state can take along these lines is having a tax expenditure report, which is like a laundry list of all the tax breaks in your tax code. At a bare minimum, these reports tell you uh, the dollar value of every exemption in, say, the personal income tax or the corporate tax or the sales tax. Uh, when these were, and, and North Carolina's tax, the tax expenditure report, which has been in existence for close to a decade now, I guess, uh, does these things. It could do more. Uh, a really good tax expenditure report does a couple of things that North Carolina's system does not do. One is that it evaluates explicitly the objectives of an existing tax break and asks, is this tax break really meeting those objectives? Uh, the second is that it provides a longer term fiscal estimate. You know, this is important for things like an aging population or the shift to services. The short term impact can be very different from the long term impact. The third is that a good tax expenditure report has some mechanism in place for requiring people to meet it. In most of the 30 something states that have tax expenditure reports, the most uh, functional purpose they serve is weighing down one end of a bookshelf. They don't get a lot of use, they don't get used to repeal a lot of things. There's a growing and interesting movement towards uh, enacting procedures that require lawmakers to actively address tax breaks, uh, sunsetting them uh, going forward, or requiring lawmakers to actually say why they're doing these things when they enact them. Uh, this is interesting because uh, Washington State is a state that uh, has tried to put teeth in their tax expenditure report in recent years, and uh, they've got a law now that says uh, a commission has to go look at every single tax break and ask, why does it exist? Well, the problem they ran into is, uh, you know, nobody was taking really good notes on this 60 years ago, and uh, there, there are people that, a lot of these tax breaks, there's nobody alive that remembers what they were there for. Uh, you don't want to be in that place with tax breaks going forward. There needs to be something on the record that says, here's why we did it, here's what we want to achieve, here's how many people are going to benefit, and here, importantly, is the impact it's going to have on job creation, say. You need measurable performance standards against which to judge these things. Uh, in addition, I'm going to say that uh, corporate tax disclosure in particular, I think, is something that can help uh, people understand the impact of the corporate taxes. <coughs> it's important to know if you're giving corporate tax breaks, who's getting them, what kind of jobs are being created as a result, and what kind of benefits are being created, and whether these jobs are sticking around. Uh, finally, uh, procedural elements that get in the way uh, Tabor, which uh, I understand is, is again under consideration here, uh, never really stops being under consideration in most places, is probably the worst thing you can do in terms of having an, a level playing field for considering keeping all your options on the table for a tax reform. Uh, tax caps and supermajority rules uh, constrain uh, lawmakers' decisions in a similarly bad way. So I want to give an example of what other states are doing. Uh, a, a single example, they just got enacted a couple of weeks, weeks ago. I'm excited about it, I know Meg's excited about it because she was directly involved in our work on that. Uh, uh, Meg Weehy, by the way, is our state policy director, she's right here, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Connecticut, as part of their budget solution this year, enacted a number of things which are really pretty remarkable. Uh, they increased the personal income tax rate at the top for a small number of millionaires, they phased out the benefits of lower income tax rates. They enacted, as North Carolina already has, an Amazon tax to try to get at this e-commerce problem. They applied their sales tax to a, a bunch of personal services. Uh, more controversially, they applied the sales tax to some of the goods that are typically perceived as necessities. Clothing, uh, some Northeastern states exempt clothing from sales tax. Rhode Island, uh, Connecticut used to be among them, and, and now it is not. Uh, they did a corporate income tax surcharge. Importantly, uh, they had some regressive consumption taxes. The sales tax rate and the cigarette tax rate went up, recognizing the impact this was going to have on low income families. They enacted an earned income tax credit. North Carolina has one, it's a pretty low one. So, a pretty broad base, and uh, you know, really, it's a, a pretty good plan. Uh, on the income tax, uh, if you do, uh, if you think about sort of the universe of options available to North Carolina and what the choices are, uh, obviously the first choice is do you expand the base or do you increase the rates? As I've said already, I think the, the starting point for any effort at tax reform, whether it's the income tax or any other tax, needs to be the base. Examine every exemption, examine, examine every loophole, ask should this thing exist? But uh, as you saw from the, uh, the chart a minute ago, 
it's a pretty clear case to be made that uh, increasing the rate at the top uh, on the income tax could, could help as well. So these are both things that can, can be in play on the income tax side. A uh, second element is whether you do it as a permanent or a temporary thing. I, I don't need to tell you guys about this uh, since North Carolina has taken this strategy. Uh, a third element that I think is important to highlight in the current context is whether you do income tax reform as a revenue neutral or revenue raising thing. I'm going to argue that uh, revenue raising is probably a pretty good goal from income tax reform uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, if you think about sustainable tax reform, the income tax has been shown in, in most academic studies to perform better than other taxes over the long haul. There is an interesting debate about whether uh, about whether income taxes are too volatile. Uh, you know, there, there were headlines in California five years ago about, uh, three, three years ago really, about just the, ink, the bottom falling out of income tax revenues. They've got a sharp progressive income tax. They've got huge budget deficits, and some people argue that having a progressive income tax, the volatility of capital gains income tax at the top is really what is putting them in trouble. Uh, what these people don't remember is that seven years ago, uh, California was enjoying in one year, I think, a, a $4 billion increase just in their income tax one year over the next, uh, about an eighth of which was due to Google millionaires cashing in their stock options. The thing with the income tax is that, you know, the good times are good and the bad times are bad, but on balance over the business cycle, the income tax is the most consistent performer. It keeps pace with income, it keeps pace with economic growth, and that is what you want in a tax over the long haul. That can't be said of the sales tax uh, so much, certainly not of the property tax. These aren't taxes that grow as consistently over time <coughs> as do the income tax. Uh, moreover, academic research uh, shows that sales taxes can be pretty darn volatile in, in the short run. And the chart I showed you a few minutes ago shows that uh, the bottom has been falling out of pretty much every tax the states rely on. So again, it's not volatility in the income tax that puts the states into jam right now. And the last thing I'll say about that is just that uh, if you think volatility is bad, think about the alternative. Uh, stability, I guess, is the direct alternative to that. Uh, my first car in college was an 82 Cavalier. That car was about as stable as you ever want to see it sat in the backyard on blocks for a couple of years. Uh, it wasn't going anywhere, and neither, neither are most of the revenue sources that people think of as stable, like the property tax and the cigarette tax. So there's this trade-off between volatility and, and, and stability, um, but volatile taxes in the short run tend to be the most sustainable ones in the long run. And the solution to dealing with them isn't to get rid of them, as, as some have argued in California, but to manage them well with an effective rainy day fund. <coughs> the, uh, the other concern that's been raised with progressive income taxes uh, has to do with uh, the so-called millionaire migration idea. I don't know if this, this debate has percolated down here at all, but uh, yeah. we've been uh, pretty closely involved with it because uh, uh, in Maryland, which uh, uh, you know is essentially where I live in, in, in D.C., uh, they enacted a 1% increase on millionaires uh, in 2007. And the Wall Street Journal made headlines, they've had a series of just awful editorials the last couple of years making the claim that millionaires are leaving en masse. Uh, just to give you an example of what it's been like for us in sort of dealing with this, uh, a couple of years ago the Wall Street Journal editorial board com uh, claims in a headline, 33% of Maryland millionaires disappeared the year after their, their tax hike. Uh, we got access to the data, and showed that, in fact, most of them didn't leave. They just got poor, uh, as many people did uh, during 2007 and 2008. Uh, undeterred, the Wall Street Journal comes back uh, six months later with another editorial headline saying, one-eighth of taxpayers left, 12% uh, or whatever that is. Uh, again, we did an analysis showing that the real number was 7%, and that, in fact, if you look at, over time, at just the baseline level of mobility, 5% of the uh, Maryland taxpayers were moving to other states, because that's what people do uh, every year. And so what needed to be explained was the difference between 5% and 7%. And the Wall Street Journal responded to that by six months later, pretending the whole argument had not happened. And again, it came out with a headline saying 33% of American millionaires that are leaving. The point of which is to say that in every single case where there's been a claim made about Maryland or Oregon or New Jersey or some other state losing their millionaires, it's always been based on an argument like this. The argument is not from data. The argument is from anecdote and prejudice and 
is pretending the facts aren't there. Uh, it's a frustrating thing, but the, uh, the point to bring home is just that it's not about the facts. Uh, just uh, quickly, North Carolina obviously is in the forefront of states thinking about broad-based income tax reform. Uh, but a number of other states have thought about or enacted very similar things. Uh, Rhode Island went to an AGI base uh, last year. What that means is they got rid of all their exemptions, all their deductions, and just used as a starting point. You, you can think of it as being essentially all the income uh, that we earn every day from whatever its source is. Uh, this broadens, broadens the base tremendously and gives you leeway to offer more targeted tax rates for low and middle income taxpayers. Uh, why is this a smart idea? Uh, I mentioned that uh, you know, itemized deductions are one source of leakage in the income tax. We spend money on itemized deductions uh, as a nation and, and North Carolina as a state spends money on itemized deductions uh, and it ought to be thought of that way. And if you compare the aggregate amount of money we spend on say low income housing, section 8 housing uh, directly uh, through the federal government to the amount we spend on the itemized deduction for mortgage interest, I think it's like a three to one ratio in favor of mortgage interest. This is not a decision we would make rationally, uh, and it's, it's certainly not a decision we would defend on its face if we had to defend it every year, and yet that's what we do. By eliminating itemized deductions, I think that's a, or pairing them back and turning them into a targeted credit that's available for the low and middle income families for whom we're really interested in, in making them homeowners and, and allowing home ownership to be affordable for them, we can start to have a more sane discussion about every element of public policy that's enshrined in, in uh, the tax code. Uh, taking you to an AGIB gets you there, and a growing number of states are either talking about it or actually doing it. On the sales tax, uh, the picture is worth a thousand words, I guess. Uh, what we know about the sales tax base in North Carolina is two things. One, the rate's going up, and the other is the base is getting smaller. The share of what you all spend every day that is ultimately subject to sales tax is shrinking by the day, and that is why the tax rate is going up. There's a direct trade-off here. Any steps that you take to tax more services, whether it's things you use or things you don't, is going to reduce the likelihood that the sales tax rate goes up next year or the year after that, and it's going to increase the likelihood that lawmakers can actually reduce that rate. And the good news for North Carolina is that there's a lot, uh, a lot of loopholes to play with. If you rank states according to the number of services, intangible services that they tax, North Carolina is not at the bottom of the heap, but they're pretty close. Something like 30 out of 168 potentially taxable services are taxed in the North Carolina sales tax code right now. This includes services consumed primarily by individuals and some services that are consumed by businesses. So far, the, uh, in the last few years, there hasn't been a lot of action on actually enacting sales tax base expansions. Uh, Connecticut made headlines by doing it this year in New Jersey a couple years ago. But a lot of people are thinking about it right now as scanning critical mass. The second front along which uh, there's been a lot of action, and again, I don't need to tell you guys about this, is e-commerce, uh, the, the Amazon tax approach. Uh, this is, uh, on the Amazon tax, I think the thing to know about that is that this is a second best approach. What would be preferable would be if Congress would allow states to tax e-commerce. Congress has shown remarkably little uh, interest in doing that, and I would argue that there are, there are no good reasons for Congress not to act on this immediately. In the short run, what North Carolina and other states have done with the Amazon tax is a strong second best approach to ensuring that bricks and mortar businesses can operate on a level playing field compared with uh, e-commerce folks like Amazon.com. Uh, on the corporate tax front, uh, I, I should have mentioned this initially, uh, and Rob throw something at me if I'm, I'm running out of time. I think you're good. Okay. Maybe another five, ten minutes. Okay. Uh, on, the, on the corporate front, uh, this is uh, less easily approachable at the state level in the sense that we know what's going on with the sales tax. Uh, you know, you know every time you log into Amazon.com and buy something on there, why it is the sales tax is going away because you're not paying, likely, in all likelihood, you're not paying sales tax on that purchase. With the corporate tax, it's incredibly hard to know what's going on. Uh, my organization uh, spends an alarming amount of time looking at corporate annual reports, the 10K reports, trying to tease out what they pay and what they don't. 
And we put out a report a few years ago looking at what the 270 biggest and most profitable Fortune 500 corporations nationwide pay in state income taxes. And what this chart shows is that they paid an effective tax rate of you know, less than 3%, dropping dramatically down to 2.3% by 2003. Well, what do you compare that to? The weighted average corporate income tax rate nationwide at the state level is just under six, uh, just under seven percent. So this is, you know, it's not a smoking gun because we don't really know what states uh, they're paying this to, but it's a real indicator that profitable companies, the biggest profitable companies, not on the pops, but the Fortune 500 companies, are paying a lot less than the tax rates would suggest. We know some of the reasons for this, as I said. Uh, in anecdotally, we know that companies have been tremendously creative in shifting their incomes out of states that have corporate income taxes and into states that don't, or that simply have lower rates and doing it on paper in a way that doesn't benefit the uh, state's economy at all. And we also know, uh, thanks in, in large part to the work of uh, the Justice Center, that uh, there's a simple solution, uh, combined reporting, that a majority of corporate income tax states now have. The idea with combined reporting is that instead of letting companies play this shell game by shifting their profits from here to Delaware, and you know the income in Delaware is a completely different pot, you require multi-state companies to put all their income in the same pot. And that way, you know, income doesn't get hidden anywhere. It's all in the pot, and the question is just what share of economic activity is actually happening in North Carolina versus somewhere else. It's the most effective way of immediately ending the incentive for companies to engage in tax avoidance hijinks that everybody's come up with so far. And again, a majority of states now have it. Uh, most of the businesses, most of the multi-state businesses operating in North Carolina are already subject to combined reporting in other states. So it's uh, it's a sensible reform, one that's overdue. Yeah. Disclosure, as I've said, is, uh, is an important thing as well. Uh, you can fill a warehouse of what we don't know about who's paying the corporate tax and who is not in North Carolina. We just don't know. Uh, at a minimum, state lawmakers should know how many corporations, profitable corporations, are paying corporate income tax. If they're not, we should know what credits are making this happen and what we are getting in exchange for our lost corporate tax dollars. None of these things are really meaningfully true in North Carolina or in most other states. Um, there are bad things you can say about the corporate tax, and it's important to confront them. Uh, one is that uh, it's not as big a revenue deal as, as are the other big taxes states rely on. They all have loopholes you can drive a bus through. Uh, the linkage to the federal the federal corporate tax laws, virtually every state, including North Carolina, begins its calculation of corporate taxable income with federal income. It means that when the federal corporate income tax is reduced by whatever Congress is dreaming up this week, unless you take steps, the North Carolina corporate income tax yield is going to be reduced as well. Um, and the other bad element of the corporate tax is that lawmakers, you know, rely, of course, on the revenue that it provides to bring in, bring in, uh, to bring in, to, to provide services, but they sure act like they want to get rid of it by the death of a thousand cuts. Now, there have been a number of states talking about corporate tax repeal. Uh, only Ohio has actually done it, and their experience has been pretty mixed with the replacement gross receipts tax they now have. But uh, the thing to know about this is that uh, quite a few people got elected in 2010 promising to get rid of the corporate income tax. None of them have been able to deliver, and it seems pretty clear that none of them will be able to deliver. Corporate income tax repeal is not on the agenda in North Carolina, but cutting the corporate income tax rate is. Uh, Governor Purdue proposed this as part of her February budget. And I wanted to just share a couple of reasons why I think this isn't necessarily as good an idea as maybe she does. One is that you can't think, as I said already, you can't think about tax cuts of any kind, certainly corporate tax cuts, as being unambiguously an economic development tool. Because in a balanced budget environment, particularly in a challenging balanced budget environment, any spending cut, any tax cut, results in a spending cut. And you have to think about what's the economic impact of having fewer teachers and worse roads on the economy. The second is that when you cut corporate income taxes, the benefit flows to shareholders wherever they are. Uh, for multi-state corporations, their shareholders could be in South Carolina, they could be in China, you don't know. Uh, a third is that you can write off, just as individuals can take an itemized deduction for your state income taxes on the individual level, 
companies can write off their state income taxes on their federal corporate income taxes. That means that whatever the difference is between, in the law, between the corporate income tax in North Carolina and South Carolina, according to the law, the effective difference is substantially smaller. Uh, and again, as I said, the uh, all indications, although we don't really know, are that the corporate income tax rate that North Carolina actually has in the law is sort of like a New York traffic law. It's really just a, a rough <laughs> guideline. Uh, I don't know I'm out of time, so I'll skip through this. I just want to say a couple of words about the other drain on corporate taxes, which is business tax incentives. Again, uh, if you think about whether business tax incentives have an impact, incontestable they do. They cost you money. Do they have a positive impact on your state's economic development and climate? You can't know unless you have a, a calculus that we don't really have for evaluating the uh, added investment you get versus the cost of public services. You also can't tell for any given uh, corporate tax break whether states are whether states are simply rewarding companies for what they were going to do anyway. Motorola just got $100 million from the state of Illinois for staying in the state, a thing that nobody really seemed to think they weren't going to do. Uh, lawmakers are sort of wondering uh, what's going on with that. Uh, that's the problem with any business tax incentive is you can never, ever know whether you're actually changing people's behavior or simply uh, encouraging them to give them money for what they were going to do already. So in this context, uh, 30 seconds on what I view as the, uh, the three or four really interesting plans that are out there right now in North Carolina. Uh, there's been a developing progressive plan that I've watched from afar for the last few years under the auspices of the BCC, but in tax center. A progressive plan that does a lot of things I've talked about. It goes to an AGI-based tax, again, which means you get rid of the exemption, you get rid of all the itemized deductions, you replace some of the itemized deductions with a targeted credit. So middle and low income families can still take advantage of mortgage interest, charitable, I think the medical expense deduction. You means test that you have an income limit so that folks at the high end can't take advantage of this. And you expand the low income earned income tax credit. The state currently uh, has the 10%, and this is an important step because you're also expanding the sales tax base to include a lot of personal services. A very sustainable move but also one that's gonna fall most heavily on low and middle income families. It's essential if you're gonna expand the base in this way that you think of a way of holding low income families harmless and that an EITC expansion does just that. There's a second uh, bipartisan plan put into the legislature right now that has a lot in common with this. The main difference is that the, uh, the BGC plan raises a substantial amount of money, I think $1.3 billion a year, whereas the bipartisan plan I think is closer to revenue neutral. The bipartisan plan would also uh, eliminate the corporate income tax, uh, whereas the BTC would fix it rather than throwing it away by enacting combined reporting. The third interesting piece that's in play right now is not a plan, because the details aren't known yet, I'll call it the Republican concept. And the concept, as far as we know, it's again, it's an AGI-based tax, which is good, but it's also sharply lowering the rates in a way that would actually reduce the importance of the income tax and almost certainly not raise revenue overall, which is kind of an interesting choice for a state facing a multi-billion dollar budget deficit. Uh, and the last piece of this puzzle is Governor Purdue's budget uh, proposal from February, as I said, which uh, isn't about the base at all. It's about extending a temporary rate increase in the sales tax, which again is short-term, that's short-term fix, not long-term reform, and cutting the corporate tax rate, which as I said, for a number of reasons, shouldn't be thought of as reform at all. Uh, in, in fairness, Purdue has said that she supports, I think, some elements of the base expansions. Uh, that's what the BTC plan looks like from a distributional perspective, or a version of it that we looked at a while, a while back. You're looking at a one point something billion dollar tax hike a year, but you're also looking at cutting taxes substantially for the poorest, poorest 40 percent of North Carolinians, a trivial tax hike for folks in the middle, and a progressive tax hike for those at the very top. Uh, doing this and raising uh, more than a billion dollars a year is, is a neat trick, and I think it's a sign of a well-designed plan. Uh, I should probably stop right here at this. Uh, well, that's great. We'll, we'll have some questions, Matt. Thank you very much. Uh, Alexander, did you want to make any comments about?
the budget and tax service worker. Did Matt do a good job of explaining what y'all are up to? I think so. I just would. Um, come on up. Come, come check the microphone for a second. And we'll have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, and hopefully, we'll <coughs> quickly in a question and answers. I don't want to take too much time, but I want to thank Matt for raising some of the key issues we're facing here in North Carolina and just say that for years, the Budget and Tax Center has been trying to not just start a conversation about revenue reform, but really move towards action. And I think now more than ever, we know in the current fiscal situation that North Carolina is in, that we need to be thinking long-term about revenue reform. Um, there's every reason to believe that will be challenging in the current environment. Um, I think highlighting two of the points that Matt made about what we're hearing around the tax credits for working families and their potential elimination. That was a significant achievement that we all worked towards here in North Carolina to make sure our system was fairer. Um, we need to fight for that. And then also looking at the um, corporate income tax rate cuts and any um, rate cuts now at a time when we would um, need the revenue to support our public investments is another issue of serious concern. Um, I just flag again for you all that our revenue plan is over on the table. I hope that you'll pick up a copy and read through it and get in touch if you want to talk in more detail about it. Um, this is an issue that we'll continue to work on and with your help, hopefully move move forward as, as the months go ahead. Thank you. So do we have uh, questions from folks? Let me get to the back. Is this for Matt? Matt, you may want to go back up to the microphone. My name is Joe Johnston. I'm an interested citizen. Uh, you mentioned you started your talk out talking about Proposition 13, which uh, reduced, drastically cut, capped the property tax in, in California. And the effect that seemed to start a, a series of problems. Uh, you mentioned the property tax, but has your organization looked at the two parts of property tax separately? That is, the land part and the building part and what a shift of, of, to one or the other would do to economic activity. Seems in certain cities in Pennsylvania where they've gone to a two-rate tax system where they tax the buildings and improvements lower than the land and increased it on the land have uh, worked to, to the economic benefit of those cities that have done that. Right. Uh, we haven't spent a lot of time looking at uh, the land value approach for the simple reason that uh, you know, our, our primary struggle with the property tax is simply convincing people that it's actually a good tax to have in any kind of property. Of course. Uh, it, it historically is always the least uh, least popular tax uh, state or local governments levy. And so the first step for us is just getting people to recognize that this, you know, that property is a form of wealth and that if you're going to tax it properly, it's a, it's a good tax. And, and that the first thing we need to think about is making the, the base as broad as possible ensuring that there are low income protections so that whether you're taxing just land or the, the value of the buildings on the land, folks, uh, you know, low income working families and especially seniors shouldn't be taxed out of their homes. Um, you know, the land value tax is a whole different argument that I think maybe states aren't ready to deal with yet because there, there are some fundamental administrative concerns with the property tax as well as the basic hate, hate relationship that people seem to have with it that we need to confront first. But it's, 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 it's certainly worth thinking about. Other questions? Uh, Matt, I'm going to ask you about the, the issue of, if you have like a takeaway for us, I mean, obviously all of us are going to go out and back to our real life uh, jobs and families and neighborhood cocktail parties and have a discussion about whether high taxes are actually a disincentive to economic development. And, I mean, obviously we have, this we have these arguments all the time. Is there something you can bestow upon us from your experience in 45 states? I mean, that, that are some sort of takeaway arguments on that debate that, is, that we all engage in with our friends and colleagues so much? Well, I guess one thing I would say is that uh, right now we're all in the same suit. And if you look at the states that are doing worse right now, uh, there are states like Florida, uh, Nevada, which is just a mess, states which, uh, you know, according to the, the anti-tax conventional wisdom are sort of the shining lights of the economic permanent. Uh, you know, but we know, uh, because, as I said, everybody's in the same suit, that simply cutting taxes and not having income taxes or corporate taxes is the furthest thing from a panacea. 
uh, these states are, uh, are not doing that well at all. Um, I think, uh, as I said, if the, the second thing to, to know is that, and, it, and it's, it astonishes me how regular this ends up being true, Pretty much any time you see somebody making a claim about the negative economic impact of a tax hike, whether it's a millionaire's tax or a sales tax base expansion, which in Ohio five years ago was just gonna drive all the tattoo parlors out of business, I think. <laughs> the, other, the other is a tattoo parlors lobby. Um, you know, these, these effects are either imagined or anecdotal, and no one can ever really show uh, a relationship between the level of taxes and quality of the state's economy, and I think there's a real good reason for that. The reason is that nobody wants to hike taxes. Uh, Taken on their own, we, we, don't, we don't like them. We recognize that taxes buy important things, services that we can't provide for ourselves that we all value. And when lawmakers make the very difficult decision to increase these taxes, either through the rate or through expanding the base, it's because they think they don't have a choice. It's because if they don't do it, Schools are going to suffer, roads are going to suffer. And that's why I just think you can't make any linkage at all between the level of taxes and economic development because it's a two-sided coin. When you buy one, you're buying the other. Back right here. I wanna follow up on uh, that question. I remember in New York, oh, maybe a decade or more ago, uh, probably the best thing done, and it may have been by the Attorney General, who systematically went through the tax incentives, the corporate tax breaks, and showed that they had absolutely no influence on job creation. And I wondered if you know, that study was being done maybe in, in more detail. And the second thing I didn't want to forget, that Alexandra tomorrow, and I hope others, are going to be with the NAACP and other partners in the General Assembly, in the auditorium, presenting what a good tax package would look like, having our own conversation as the legislature is meeting in another office. But I wondered if you'd comment on, on such a study, because it isn't just general knowledge, but it really targeted every single corporate loophole and tax break, and by the way, associated them with the legislators that proposed them, <laughs> so we could see who was, who was paying right. uh, or paid off. Um, so. Well, uh, the, bad, the first thing I'll say is that uh, uh, there's so much privacy around uh, the provision of corporate tax breaks that all too often we just don't know who's getting them. So it, it's hard to know how, how effective they can be. Uh, when business leaders have candid moments, uh, you know, as Mayor Bloomberg did in New York City a while ago, or Paul O'Neill, who used to run, I think, Alcoa, was it, before he became Secretary of Treasury? Yeah. Um, you know, these guys will say in candid moments, if, you know, if, if you're basing your investment decisions, your relocation decisions as a business on tax breaks, you don't have a business, you know? It, uh, in the end, these things can't uh, be effective if you have a decent business plan. Um, having said that, you can, if you want, <coughs> figure out the economic, you know, how many jobs are being created as a result of a tax break. And I think every state that provides tax breaks of any kind should have legislation in place mandating that these companies tell you how many jobs they're creating what the wages, what the health benefits are, what the state is getting for these things. The bad news is that even when you do that, you can't tell that they weren't gonna do it anyway. So you can never know, and, and this is the reason why academic studies, you know, are they're just completely inconclusive on this point. Nobody can prove academically a linkage between the provision of corporate tax breaks and the state's economic growth. You know, the reason for that is, is just that uh, all too often, I think the norm is that you're giving people money for doing what they were gonna do anyway. We have one more question from Representative Luke Well, Lisa, if I could, a quick comment and then a question. Um, one of the things that's going on is we all know we don't have enough revenue in North Carolina, but for me, the frustrating uh, part about the public debate has been that almost everyone acquiesces in the sales tax is the only way to bring forward the revenue. I'll just mention that uh, Speaker Tillis is assured that these uh, bills will not go anywhere, but I put in a House Bill 879, a millionaire's tax, the tax that uh, as referenced, uh, that would just go, which uh, affects uh, uh, 5,000 out of 4 million uh, tax filers in North Carolina and brings in $90 million a year. Um, that's one that in your public discussion, I wish you would talk about. The second is that Representative Weiss and I have reinstituted the, or put in again, the, the progressive income tax surcharge as part of the temporary taxes. Uh, talk about that to the House Bill 890. 
just if you will do that in terms of your conversation with people and in letters to the editor reference the progressive taxes, that'd be helpful. My question to you is, why is it that everything falls back to the sales tax as the discussion for how to raise revenue? Why are the progressive taxes, progressive income taxes forgotten in your experience around the country? Including well, very much here in North Carolina. Sure. Uh, I think it goes back to people and their perception of taxes. Uh, you know, you don't pay a sales tax bill to the IRS. You pay it a dime at a time, a nickel at a time every time you purchase things. It's very easy not to get a sense of what the impact is on your livelihood over the course of a year. People don't understand the impact it has on them. The income tax is quite visible. The property tax is quite visible. Uh, but the bottom line is that uh, for, for, for most North Carolinians, a, the income tax is going to be a better deal than the sales tax. It is, you need to know that. Um, and all, all you can do is show people charts and try to explain it to them. But uh, the, uh, you know, and I think it's important to reiterate, uh, as, as I hope I can that uh, I think sales tax based broadening is sustainable, it's vital, it's a thing the state needs to do going forward. But if, if fairness is, is what you're interested in, it is not the answer. Uh, low income families, middle income families are going to be hit hardest by this. This is why if you're going to do it, and again, I, I think some form of base expansion is a good thing, it's absolutely vital to preserve the existing low income refundable credits the state has and expand them. Uh, North Carolina has an EITC, that's great. It should be bigger. Certainly if you're going to engage in any kind of revenue raising on the sales tax front. Um, uh, oh, and, and again, uh, yeah, the, the millionaire's tax. I mean, the income tax needs to be the engine for revenue raising. Uh, sales tax is important, but the income tax is the only progressive option the state has. If you think that a regressive tax system is wrong, if you think that it's no good for the lowest effective tax rates to be applied to the very best off families, the only solution for achieving what certainly everyone in this room would, would agree on, that at worst you should have a tax system that is flat overall, the only mechanism for getting you closer to that is more progressive in the income tax. Well, on that note, that's a really good note. <laughs> Matt, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming today. We'll be having another, we may be scheduling an event very soon in the month of June on this taxpayer bill of rights business, so stay tuned. Uh, we'll have some more fun tax talk. And uh, these are taxing times, so uh, hang in there. And,